Bott, and I'm in the University of Alabama. My mentor is Dr. Diana Schweika, and I work in medical physics in the Department of Radiation Oncology. And my project is Monte Carlo Simulation of Ionization Chamber Imagery Response. Um, I worked in the medical campus a lot this summer, so I got to see a lot of the clinical parts of medical physics. And so this is a, their new machine that they're commissioning. And this was helpful because my research is based on the my research is based on the um, machines that they use. Oops, I'm sorry. My research is based on the linear accelerators that they use for therapy. And so I modeled a simulation of an MEV data source and an ionization chamber and a cap, attenuating cap. And an ionization chamber is a commonly used dissymmetry tool for taking these measurements of the machines. And I used MCMP5 to model this simulation, which is just a radiation transport software. <coughs> this is the original geometry that we started working with, and it's a lot more complex. We found that we didn't need this because in an article that we're using to base like, our research on, they ended up using a lot more simple geometry, which I'll explain on the next slide. But this wasn't a total waste now that we have the input files, because one, it helped me really learn MCMP, and then, so it helped with the learning curve. And two, we can use it to run simulations because this is the geometry you'd use to run like experimental um, measurements with the actual machine. So we could run these simulations and compare it to the experimental data. So this is the new geometry that they used. And as you can see, it's a lot more simple. And they use a monoenergetic point source and then 300 centimeters away. In a vacuum, they, use their, they have their ion chamber. And one of the main differences is that here they had an ion chamber that's three centimeters, and we went off the, there's a similar report that they used for experimental measurements. And so I used the exact dimensions that they gave for the caps because that way it'll compare well to experimental data, and that way we have exact measurement, or dimensions. And then this is the close-up of the ion chamber and cap, which is now a big part of our geometry. And so, the photons just hit the cap and release secondary electrons, and this forms ion pairs. And the ion pairs are separated by an electric field, which is created by the electrodes within the air chamber. So my objective was to create a response function for the brass cap. And first we had to do the same thing with the PMMA cap, because that's what we have published response functions of. And so if I, can, if I was able to obtain an accurate response function for the PMMA cap, that was um, compares well to the published one, then we know that our models are correct. And then I can do the same with the brass cap. And so this that was just the start of it. And then this is the response functions. This is the published response function that was in the article. And as you can see, this blue one is the PMMA cap response function that I've been trying to get this whole summer. And then as you can also see there's no brass um, there's no response function for a brass cap. And then the response function varies greatly depending on the material. And so we have like a high atomic number material, which is the tungsten, and a low atomic material, which is a low atomic number material, which is the PMMA cap. And then these will be used to restore the spectrum. So we ran uh, 21 different simulations for energies ranging from 0.1 to 10 MeV. And then we have our data from two main sources, which are these tallies. And then, so the F8 tally is the energy deposited in the air chamber. And the star F2 tally is the amount of energy passing through the surface of the cap per centimeter squared. And the way that the software runs this, the, they normalize it so that it's like energy deposited in the air chamber per particle. And then we also needed air mass and the number of particles that were run in the simulation. And those are given in the output file. And then, as well, as well as the tallies. And we ran enough particles through the simulation to get our air for the tallies below 2%. This is the <coughs> equation that we used for our analysis. The main equation is response is equal to dose over fluence. And the way that we get dose is to take the FA tally and if the number of particles through the simulation are different for the F8 and F2, you have to normalize it by multiplying it by NPS, which is the number of particles. And then for F8, we divided it by air mass, and this gave us MEV per gram. 
and first we, fun we graphed it with the function of energy to see where we were at in our progress of our research. And then we realized that if we run the F2 tally also, we can get these functions, these units of centimeters squared. So then we normalized this tally, and that gave us MEV per centimeter squared. And when you divide dose by fluence, you get the correct units per response, which are centimeters per gram. And if you remember, and if not, will be shown again. These are the, the units that were used for the response values in the published graph. And so this is just the values of function of energy in calc here. This is just an example of all of the calculations and the data that we have. So this blue is, a, is the F2 tally, and the green column is the F8. And then down here in purple, we have air mass. And we also made some changes to where we collected our F2 tally and within the geometry. So then that all gave us, once we did the calculations I just explained, that gave us our orange column, which are our response values, and we were able to graph this as a function of energy. So throughout the summer, we had a lot of problems <laughs> with our geometry and different things. So at first we realized that our source was a disk source, and the radius was too small for the source to cover the entire chamber. So we made it a larger source that and make sure that it covers the entire chamber. And we put it from three centimeters away and 300 centimeters away. But both of these failed to give us good results still. And then we realized that with a disk source, we don't have the same divergence that you would have from the point source like they have in their published geometry. So we went ahead and tried just the point source, the exact geometry that they published. But the problem with this is that since it's a point source and it's going everywhere, the amount of particles that you need takes so much time to run it for the air to be low for the tallies that it's not practical. So then we came up with another geometry, which I'll explain on the next slide. And then one other problem we had is that I switched up the densities and in input files <laughs> for the whole summer. So we fixed that this weekend, actually. And then so with this new geometry that I'm about to explain, we finally got results this weekend. So it took all summer. And I don't think we're going to get results, but then we're really happy. <laughs> and then, so, <laughs> so this is the geometry that we have currently. It's still a point source, but we found a way to collimate it into a cone. And so we made sure that it covers, the fraction of the cone covers the entire ion chamber. And it's still 300 centimeters away. But that way the software doesn't have to track particles going everywhere. Because if they're not going in the right direction, it kills them. And then also we have, you have to like encompass your geometry in a universe. And so when the particles hit the edge of this universe, they're killed. And we had a really big sphere. And so to like maximize efficiency, we just made it a cylinder that covers this long range of the geometry. And so with these two changes, we were able to get better results with less air in less time and with like less particles. And then we did this for all 21 energies. And so these are the results that we just got this weekend. Um, this is the response function that we got, and then again, the published for comparison. And as you can see, the max of ours is similar. It's right before the 1 MEV, just like this. And then at 10 MEV, it also goes down, which is a big problem we had with a lot of the different geometries we used. And then also, there are the correct magnitude, which is a big problem that we had throughout the summer. And the values are slightly off, and but I would assume that's attributed to the difference in cap sizes and dimensions of the ion chamber, as they had three, and then I used the public dimensions in the different report, as I mentioned earlier. And then, since my objective is to do or to get a response function for the brass cap, we had time on Saturday to create these files. So we changed the material and density, and then I changed the dimensions of the cap to the actual dimensions that Demetra, the grad student who did the experimental work, used. So it matches her actual dimension, or actual cap too. And so this is the response function that we ended up getting, and that was the objective of my research. So it's really exciting that we got this weekend. So I would say, originally I planned on saying that the continuation of my research would be to get what I just showed you, but since we were able to get it, and it's very close to what we wanted, I would probably try to run simulations of the geometry that I explained at the beginning of my presentation and compare it to the experimental data. And I'd also like to work with Dr. Shvedka to get my project to a stage of publication. And then just why is this useful? It's just, 
The response function is needed to restore the spectrum. So you can take experimental measurements and restore the spectrum, but you still need a response function. And so Dimitri used, a, she digitized the published graph, but it would be better to have these actual data points because they're one set to her exact dimensions of the cap. And they're also actual data points rather than doing a digitization of it. And then also the way that we got the brass cap response functions, since it wasn't published, we could do this with other materials, which could be very helpful. And then because we originally thought that the geometry depended on the machine somewhat in the linear accelerator head, since it doesn't and it's a lot simpler, it could be applied to a variety of machines and it could be used in different components. And these are just two papers I used most or used in my research. And then I want to thank Dr. Chvaika and Dimitri for all the help you gave me this summer. And that's it. Any questions? Function, she can use this data to restore in her restoration of the spectrum, and it'll be more accurate than like she didn't she, um, like adjust it to try and make no, how did you get the data used? Well, so I, I scaled it down for the tungsten, mm -hmm. but that was assuming so brass is relatively high atomic number, right? Mm -hmm. And so we were trying to get a higher response of the ionization chamber at the higher energy ranges. So we thought that brass was going to be a high enough atomic number. Um, obviously, Julie's sort of research shows that it's actually more responsive on the lower end. But why the brass specifically is of interest? Because that's what they have reported. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> they, have the us, yeah. they have what? Brass caps, that's what they use in clinic for oh, okay. in-air okay. measurements. So okay. what and we were trying to make this project with Dimitra as clinically applicable as possible because people can publish um, research articles, but then if you go to real accelerator using equipment that is available in clinic, then what do you do? Any other questions? Okay, so this is, um, if you remember during Dr. Pearson's talk, he mentioned that we're getting a new machine in the medical clinic because it's there's competition to keep up with the latest and greatest machines. So this is the pictures that I took of commissioning of the EDGE. And I went in on a Saturday with Dimitra and Dr. Schweika and got to see what they're doing. So I'm sure the, the group will explain it a lot better than me. But from my understanding, this ion chamber here can move around within it and the water acts, the phantom acts as a patient because it'll move down and then it collects the energy that's the, the it detects the energy at different depths and that way if you have an area in the body that's like 10 centimeters in you can plan for how much of the dose will actually reach that part of the patient is that right yeah so <laughs> but anyway i took pictures of it because it's as dr frank has said it's really rare and i got to see it so i thought it was really cool you need some they get bigger.